Hi everyone, this video is sponsored by Chegg. Stick around later to learn more about the helpful science and medicine education offered within the Chegg study pack. This lesson is on osteoarthritis. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the risk factors for getting osteoarthritis. Then we're going to talk about the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. If we were to actually look at the word osteoarthritis, osteo refers to bone, arth refers to joint, and the suffix itis refers to inflammation. It essentially means inflammation of a bone joint, but it is actually considered a non-inflammatory arthritis compared to other types of inflammatory arthritis conditions like rheumatoid arthritis. So it is a non-inflammatory arthritis that is either polyarticular or monoarticular. Polyarticular meaning that there are many joints that are affected, oftentimes more than four or five joints that are affected, or it can be monoarticular, which means that only one joint is affected. We're going to talk about the joints that are more commonly affected in this condition later on in this lesson. And the joint changes in osteoarthritis are often due to wear and tear or other structural and mechanical factors. Again, we're going to talk more in detail as to these factors later on in this lesson. Now, osteoarthritis is actually the most common type of arthritis. It accounts for approximately three quarters of cases of arthritis. And the prevalence of this condition increases with increasing age. So as a patient gets older, they're more likely to have joints that are affected by this condition. And to see just how prevalent this condition can be, the distal interphalangeal joint or the DIP joint, which is the last knuckle joint of a finger, is affected in approximately 60% of individuals over 60 years of age. So very common condition. Now, before we actually get into osteoarthritis, there are actually two major types of osteoarthritis. One of them is going to be primary osteoarthritis, which is going to be the focus of this lesson. And then there is secondary osteoarthritis, which is caused by other medical conditions. So with regards to primary osteoarthritis, there can be generalized subtype, which is where there is multiple joints that are affected, and this is more common in female patients. Or it can be an isolated primary osteoarthritis, which would be where a single joint is affected and oftentimes the hips are affected. Or it can be erosive osteoarthritis, which is going to be a rare type of osteoarthritis. This is where oftentimes the DIP and the PIP joints are affected in the hands. And this also has episodes of inflammation, and there's oftentimes a genetic cause in these types of osteoarthritis. Now, secondary osteoarthritis is when there's another medical condition that is causing the osteoarthritis. There are many different conditions that can lead to osteoarthritis, and we categorize them as the following. Mechanical causes, which can occur in post-surgical cases. Neuropathic causes, which include diabetes and a nerve injury, can also lead to a secondary osteoarthritis. Inflammatory causes, like rheumatoid arthritis and crystal arthropathies, can also lead to a secondary osteoarthritis. So rheumatoid arthritis itself is an inflammatory arthritis, but the joint changes can lead to damage to the joints leading to a secondary osteoarthritis. Certain metabolic conditions can cause a secondary osteoarthritis. These include hemochromatosis, where there is iron deposition into joints, Wilson's disease, where there is copper deposition into joints, and we can also see it with Cushing's disease and Paget's disease. And then certain blood conditions like hemophilia can also lead to a secondary osteoarthritis due to hemarthroses or bleeding into the joints. This can lead to damage and changes to the joint. And that leads us into our video sponsor, Chegg. Now, a lot of science and medical topics can be challenging and complex to learn and remember. But with the Chegg Study Pack, you can have access to an enormous database where you can learn about other topics in rheumatology, cardiology, and endocrinology. Each topic is organized in a very clear way and guides you all the way from the basics of the topic through to the more advanced information. For me personally, I've used Chegg in the past during my pre-med undergraduate studies as an additional learning resource, which was definitely helpful. I've also used the Chegg Study Pack to further complement my studies on a variety of science and medical topics and have found the resources very helpful. The Chegg Study Pack is particularly useful because it also helps improve your writing skills and your math skills as well. Not only does Chegg have a larger library of their own educational resources, they also provide a variety of significant discounts on many different textbooks which is incredibly helpful for students. Chegg also has many different practice tests to help with your studies as well. If you want to get access to this great resource, check out the link in the description below for $5 off the first month of Chegg Study Pack. Now let's talk about the risk factors for getting primary osteoarthritis. We talked about this before, but one of the main risk factors is increasing age. As a patient gets older, their chances of having osteoarthritis increases. 
Being of the female gender is also another risk factor, and this goes along with postmenopausal age groups. So because of hormonal changes, there can be decreases in bone density. This can increase the risk of osteoarthritis. Being overweight and obese can also increase the risk for osteoarthritis. Smoking is another risk factor. We can also see previous injury, so there can be post-traumatic osteoarthritis. Osteopenia or osteoporosis can also increase the risk of osteoarthritis. Vitamin D deficiency can also contribute to all of this as well, and this can increase the risk of osteoarthritis. Repetitive activities, micro traumas, where there is small traumas over many, many years. So through repetitive activities, this can increase the risk of osteoarthritis in certain joints. Certain occupations can also increase the risk of osteoarthritis. We may see this with farmers. And then a family history. So if your parents or siblings have osteoarthritis, you're more likely to also have osteoarthritis yourself. Now, before we actually get into the pathophysiology, it's important to understand some of the anatomy of the joints that can be affected in osteoarthritis. So synovial joints are the type of joint that is going to be affected in osteoarthritis. So here is a synovial joint, and there are particular anatomical structures in a synovial joint. First, there is articular cartilage. So there's articular cartilage that actually lines and covers the end of the bones on each bone that forms the joint. There is a synovial membrane that covers the joint, and this synovial membrane produces synovial fluid. So there's a synovial fluid that acts as a lubricant for the joint. And then there is an outer fibrous capsule, and both the synovial membrane and the fibrous capsule make up what is called the articular capsule. So now that we know what a synovial joint looks like and some of the basic anatomical structures of a synovial joint, let's talk about the pathophysiology in osteoarthritis. There are actually three main processes that occur in the pathophysiology of osteoarthritis. One of them is going to be wear and tear. Another one is going to be structural degeneration. And the other one is joint inflammation. So wear and tear or overuse of the joint is going to be the most important factor. And this contributes to aging of the joint. Now there are particular processes that occur within the joint. First, oftentimes what can be noted is that there can be a loss of that articular cartilage. So the cartilage that lines or covers the ends of both of the bones that make up the joint can begin to degrade or become lost over time. This can then lead into increased bone growth and formation. So the bones can start to grow inward and this can cause joint space narrowing. The extracellular matrix of the cartilage of the joint contains metalloproteinases, which are enzymes, and these become activated. And this leads to the cartilage extracellular matrix becoming degraded over time. And overall, what can happen is at the beginning of this process, we can see chondrocyte proliferation, and then ultimately we can see chondrocyte apoptosis or programmed cell death of chondrocytes. And then there can also be joint inflammation. So inflammation can occur within the joint, and this can be noted in increased inflammatory cytokine levels within the joint. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of osteoarthritis. It's important to note that some patients with osteoarthritis may be asymptomatic, which means that they don't have any symptoms at all. If they do have symptoms, they're going to have symptoms of arthritis, meaning that they're going to have joint pain. And this joint pain is described as a dull, achy, or throbbing pain, and that pain is worsened with use. Now, there are particular joints that are affected with osteoarthritis. We're going to talk a bit more about this in detail in the next slide, but one of the most common joints that is affected is the knee, and another commonly affected joint is the DIP joint in the hands, which is the last knuckle joint of the finger. But the MCP joint of the hand is often not involved. The MCP joint is the metacarpal phalangeal joint. It's often not involved, but it can be involved in some cases. We're going to talk about those cases later on in this lesson. But classically, it's not involved in osteoarthritis. And if you were to push on the joint line, there is tenderness at that joint line. So that is also another finding with this arthritis. Now, this is a non-inflammatory arthritis, as we mentioned earlier. So that means that there are particular characteristics of the symptoms of this condition. So for one, there may be mild inflammation that may be present. And what is noted with non-inflammatory arthritis is that the pain worsens with movement and improves with rest. This is different than inflammatory arthritis where pain improves with movement and worsens with rest. Another finding with the non-inflammatory arthritis is that morning stiffness, so when you wake up in the morning, your joints are often stiff, the stiffness of the joints occurs for less than 30 minutes. And this also applies with stiffness after inactivity. And this differs in comparison to inflammatory arthritis where the morning stiffness is oftentimes greater than one hour in duration. Another important characteristic of a non-inflammatory arthritis is that there is no pain at night. 
And oftentimes there's no effusions, although there can be effusions in some joints in some patients. And the arthritis in osteoarthritis is often going to occur in an asymmetric pattern. There's going to be an asymmetric distribution of affected joints oftentimes, but what can be noted is that the knees may be affected bilaterally. So although there may be a couple of joints in one hand that are affected that are not affected in the other hand, the knees may be affected bilaterally. So both knees may be affected now here's a diagram of some of the more commonly affected joints in osteoarthritis. We can see the neck being involved. We can see the lower back. We can see hips being involved. We can see the base of the thumb, the DIP and PIP joints. The knees can also be commonly involved. Again, this is the most common joint that is affected in osteoarthritis. And then the base of the big toe can be affected with osteoarthritis as well. Now there are some other particular joint findings in osteoarthritis, and this is going to be particularly common with the hands that are affected. So again, the DIP joints are right here. These are the PIP joints. These are both affected in osteoarthritis. And the overgrowth of particular joints can lead to certain clinical features, which are called Heberden's nodes, which are where there is an overgrowth of the bone of the DIP joints of the hands. This can look like this in some patients. So this is Heberden's nodes. And then there's also Bouchard's nodes of the hands. This is where the PIP joints, or this joint right here, the proximal interphalangeal joint of the hand is affected. And here is an image of Bouchard's nodes. So again, Heberden's nodes and Bouchard's nodes. There may also be squaring of the thumbs, which essentially means that the carpal metacarpal joint becomes squared in appearance. There looks like a corner of a square. So that can also occur with osteoarthritis of the hands as well. And again, these are all signs of bony enlargement and osteophyte development. Then there's some other findings within the joint as well. This includes crepitus with active and passive movement of the joint. So crepitus is a cracking or snapping sound when moving the joint. We can imagine that if the bones are overgrown and there's narrowed joint space, the bones will essentially slide over each other causing a cracking sound. So the crepitus can occur. There can be decreased range of motion. So you're losing that synovial joint space. So the range of motion can become limited over time. The joint itself can become enlarged as the bones undergo overgrowth. This can cause an enlargement of the affected joint as we saw in Heberden's nodes and Bouchard's nodes. Joint deformity can also take place as we can see with enlargement of affected joints. Joint instability can also occur so the joint itself can become unstable over time. Gelling of the joint may also occur. Gelling means that when the joint has become inactive, it can become stiff. And then patients may also have neuropathic pain as well. There are particular stages of osteoarthritis denoted as early, mid, and severe or late stage osteoarthritis. So with regards to early osteoarthritis, this is where there is joint pain of the affected joint that occurs with particular physical activity. So it is a predictable pain triggered by particular movements. So when you move your arm or finger a particular way, that is known to trigger some pain in that joint. With regards to mid-osteoarthritis, it has the same symptoms of early osteoarthritis, but the pain will also occur sporadically. So the pain can be triggered by particular movements, but then can also occur sporadically, just spontaneously. The joint itself can also lock up. So the joint can lock up and the patient may not be able to move it at all. And over time, the pain becomes more frequent. And eventually, the pain will lead to issues with daily functioning. And then this leads us into late or advanced osteoarthritis. This is where the pain of the joint becomes constant, and oftentimes it's going to be a dull ache, and oftentimes the joint itself has very reduced range of motion. Now let's talk about how clinicians diagnose osteoarthritis. Oftentimes it's going to be a clinical diagnosis. So the clinician is going to look at the joint. They're going to look at the history and do a physical examination on the joint. It's also important to think about secondary osteoarthritis, and this can occur in different joints than we talked about before, and these include the elbow and the shoulders. The elbow can occur with jackhammer use. Shoulders can more commonly occur in baseball players and pitchers more specifically. Ankles can also be involved in secondary osteoarthritis. And the MCP joint, which we talked about being classically not involved in primary osteoarthritis, it can be involved in secondary osteoarthritis, especially in cases of hemochromatosis. And there can also be some additional associated signs and symptoms depending on the underlying cause. If it is rheumatoid arthritis, there's going to be many other different joint deformities and changes and other 
extra articular manifestations. If it is hemochromatosis, there can be skin bronzing and liver disease. So again, many different additional associated signs and symptoms depending on the underlying cause of the secondary osteoarthritis. Now, another very important way of diagnosing osteoarthritis is through radiographic imaging using an x-ray. If it is in a lower extremity joint, like the knee, it's important to x-ray the patient when standing. And there are particular hallmark findings to look out for on an x-ray of an osteoarthritic joint. These include joint space narrowing. So if we look at this image here, we can see that the joint space of this joint has become narrowed. There can also be subchondral sclerosis, osteophyte formation, so we can see an osteophyte right here, and subchondral cysts can also be noted as well. So those are going to be very, very important to remember. These are hallmark findings on an x-ray of an osteoarthritic joint. Joint space narrowing, subchondral sclerosis, osteophytes, and subchondral cysts. And it's also important to make note of the fact that the severity of symptoms may not correlate with radiographic findings. So it may look very, very bad, or it may not look bad at all on the x-ray, and that may not correlate with the symptoms that a patient is experiencing. Laboratory tests can be performed, although they're going to be normal. And this is important to make note of because there's going to be negative rheumatoid factors and a normal ESR or normal erythrocyte sedimentation rate is also going to be found with osteoarthritis. And if a clinician was to actually take a sample of the synovial fluid of the joint, the synovial fluid is going to be essentially normal. It's going to be clear or yellow in coloration. There's going to be less than 2,000 white blood cells and it's going to be a negative culture. There's not going to be any bacteria in that joint. Now let's talk about how clinicians treat osteoarthritis. The treatment of osteoarthritis is going to begin with lifestyle modification. This is going to be very, very important with treating osteoarthritis. So physiotherapy can be important. That can be something that can be helpful for especially patients who have osteoarthritis of their knees. Occupational therapy can also be utilized in some patients, which can also be helpful with hand osteoarthritis in particular. And weight loss. Weight loss is going to be very, very important, especially in those who are overweight or obese. And in fact, losing 10% of body mass where a patient is overweight or obese, so meaning that their BMI is greater than 25, losing 10% of their body mass can improve knee osteoarthritis symptoms by up to 50%. So very, very important is weight loss. And then exercise is also important, especially for healthy joints. So this is more going to be a preventative mechanism. So exercising, again, can help with healthy joints. If it is late stage osteoarthritis, exercise may actually exacerbate the osteoarthritis itself. And then with regards to knee osteoarthritis, quadricep strengthening exercises can also be important. Patients with more severe symptoms of knee osteoarthritis are often found to have weakened quadricep strength. So quadricep strengthening exercises can be important for these patients. Assistive therapies like splints and canes may be used. Heat or cold application, especially for hand osteoarthritis, can be helpful. And then yoga can also be helpful with some patients as well. Now, some more treatments of osteoarthritis include pharmacotherapies. These include non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs. And topical and oral NSAIDs can be utilized. These are going to be first-line pharmacotherapies for osteoarthritis. It's important to try topical NSAIDs first, so diclofenac can be helpful. And then oral NSAIDs can include ibuprofen and naproxen, but these should be limited in those with kidney disease and peptic ulcer disease. So these types of medications can be hard on the kidneys and the stomach. Now, it's also important to note that some other treatments have been noted to have low effectiveness or limited evidence. Although they may be effective for some patients, these include acetaminophen use, so Tylenol use may be effective with some patients. If it is, it's more mild than NSAIDs, but in those that are not able to use NSAIDs, acetaminophen can be helpful. And then capsaicin cream can also be used for some patients, although there is some limited evidence with regards to its use. Intraarticular injections for knee osteoarthritis can also be employed. So glucocorticoid or steroid injections into the joint can be helpful for relieving symptoms. However, when using these injections multiple times, it can lead to joint damage in some patients. And then there may be some use of hyaluronic acid injections, but this has limited evidence. Duloxetine can also be utilized as well. Duloxetine may be a way to reduce pain sensitivity for some patients. And then the supplements glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate have some mixed evidence. There may be some utilization for these supplements in actually reducing the progression of 
osteoarthritis, especially if utilized early on in the course of the disease. So glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate may be helpful in reducing the progression of this condition. Surgical options can be utilized in some cases. So this is where a partial or total knee replacement is an option. And this is going to occur when all other things have been tried, but nothing has helped the knee pain. If the pain is refractory, this is when oftentimes clinicians will move on to a knee replacement. And an alternative treatment that can be utilized to help relieve pain of osteoarthritis is acupuncture. So acupuncture can be utilized to help with pain in some cases as well. If you want to learn more about rheumatoid arthritis, please check out my lesson on that topic. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.